Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello, my relatives. Um, welcome to the third program of our Gifts of the Plant Nation series. Michelle Bowman Amaka Bia, Si Situanko Achpetua Oyate Himatahan, the Makota, Bede Ota Otue Ed, Imaja He, Wana, Emnija Scott Ed Wati. In our key, Stephanie Wana Echiaka, Kushi Waiki, Jenny Wana Echiaka, Unkana Waiki, Larika, Benny Wana Echiab. Am Petuk de Nina Iomak Bia. Um, um, I just said a welcome in uh, my language. My name is Michelle Bowman. I will be your host uh, for this, eve's, this evening's Gifts of the Plant Nation program. I was born and raised in Minneapolis. And I currently live in Indonesia, or St. Paul. And um, I used to work here at Wakantipi, a Wyankapi, formerly known as Lower Feeling Creek Project, for almost uh, four to five years. And I'm just so incredibly thrilled and honored to be back here um, to host this wonderful program. Um, like I said before, the Gifts of uh, the Plant Nation program is a program that Wakantipi, a Wyankapi, developed in order to uh, highlight. Um, a plant nation each season and talk about their stories, their medicinal benefits, their, their cultural uses and bring in elders and community members um, to share and uplift the, the gifts that all of our plant relatives have. Um, this evening, we're gonna be talking about cha e cha behu or uh, one of our favorite spring ephemerals, nettle. Um, this program is gonna run from about right now until 7.30 p.m. And I just want to acknowledge that the Gifts of the Plant Nation webinar is in part made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Um, formerly known as Lower Failing Creek Project, just a few weeks ago, uh, Wakanti Fia Awayankapi went through a name change and a rebranding. So as you can see here on our beautiful welcome slide um, towards the bottom, this is Wakanti Bi Awayangapi's new logo created by Willard Mailbear. So we're all really excited um, to announce that. And we just wanna say Wopira Tonka to all of our community members who have been here um, with us and supporting us through this name change. It's a really big deal. And, and it's so exciting that it's finally here and finally happening. Um, you can go to our website too, or Wakanti Pi Awayankapi to hear uh, the, the new pronunciation and um, just what a gift it is to see our language um, on this logo to represent this amazing native-led environmental organization here in Indonesia, Scott, or St. Paul. Um, on this uh, homepage too here, you can see this beautiful graphic that um, was created by Dakota artist Shauna Elk. And this uh, program, um, when we were writing the grant, we really wanted to figure out a way to um, support uh, Dakota women or Dakota women um, in our community. And so um, Shauna Elk, who's from Standing Rock uh, or Standing Rock, Dakota, she created all of the graphics for our Gifts of the Plant Nation series. So you can head to our website too and, and buy um, merch, um, whether that's shirts or coffee mugs or stickers, all the proceeds go to um, Wakanti Pi Awayankapi as well as our Dakota artist, Shauna Elk. Um, I just also want to say to make sure to be stay tuned um, for our social media and newsletter for our upcoming summer program of the Gifts of the Plant Nation, uh, which the date will be released um, soon here. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I want to uh, Welcome you all and uh, just highlight our presenters uh, for this evening's program. On the left here, we have Kunshi Fern Naomi Rendo, who is Wakanti Pi Awayankapi's Dakota cultural educator. Uh, she's a member of the Sistin Wapten Oyate, as well as uh, Omaha and Seneca. Fern is going to be talking all about the stories and cultural uses of nettle for this evening's program. So um, we're so excited and Lucky to have Fern here to, to walk us through 
that. And then we'll have Jenna Gray Eagle, who is Wakanti Biawayankapi's environmental justice educator and stewardship coordinator, who will be talking with us about the nutritional and medicinal benefits of nettle. And then we will be hearing from Gabby, who is the restoration manager here at Wakanti Biawayankapi, as she's going to be talking about the ecological roles and kinship connections that we have to nettle. Um, Towards the end of our program, we'll be having a Q&A session. So as our presenters are sharing their knowledge, um, and if you have any questions, just make sure to type them in the chat, whether you're on Facebook or you're on um, Zoom, just type your questions um, for our presenters in the chat. I also wanted to take a moment to um, really highlight that this grant that we were able to get through um, the Metro, Metropolitan uh, Regional Arts Council allowed us to increase accessibility um, for these uh, plant medicine webinars that we're having. So as you might be able to tell, we uh, are welcoming two ASL interpreters for our program tonight. And I want to just make a, a quick note that sometimes on Facebook, our ASL interpreters might not show up. So if you are in need of that service to make sure to tune in via Zoom rather than Facebook Live. And if you are tuning in on Facebook Live, the Zoom link, uh, you can find that in your email, um, from your event email or in the Facebook event, our Zoom link is. Um, I think that is all for, for me for right now. Um, Diana Hippi, welcome again to uh, series number three of our Gift of the Plant Nation program. I'm gonna hand it off now to, um, our Dakota cultural educator, Fern Naomi Renville. Thank you for that introduction, Michela. Good evening. Fern Naomi Renville, Emma My name is Fern Naomi Renville. And yes, like Michela, I'm also Sistan Wapatin. I'm also Omaha and Seneca Cayuga through my grandmother. And as an educator, I rely on traditional storytelling to teach about our relationships with the natural world. So this is a presentation about the Dakota cultural uses of nettle. However, I want to begin with a story that I learned from coastal relatives on the West Coast. I. Um, I'm a St. Paul citizen as of a year ago, but before that I was living on the West Coast. I'm originally from the Lake Traverse Reservation, but um, got my education and have been working on the West Coast where I got to know about coastal culture. Now, if you grow up in South Dakota as a Lakota or Dakota person, we tend to be the center of our own universe. <laughs> And so I didn't know a lot about coastal people when I moved to the coast. But one of the things that I soon discovered is that coastal people value the nettle plant very much, not just for food or medicine, um, but for the practical use of making fishing nets because coastal people are fishing people, of course. Well, like I said, I'm from the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. That's not my homeland. The Lake Traverse Reservation is where my people were um, taken after we were exiled from the Twin Cities. But here in what is now known as the Twin Cities, when my Dakota people lived here on this um, Fork here in the rivers where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers come together, we were a fishing people. Fish, turtle, duck, those were the three most um, common foods that we ate. We lived on the river and we fished. And we used nettle to make our fishing nets, just like the people on the coast. So, um, as I learned about coastal culture, living in Washington state, as a Dakota person, 
And as a storyteller and educator, I did not feel very confident teaching coastal content. What do I know about coastal culture? <laughs> but something really cool has happened in Washington State. There, tribes and educators have come together to pass a um, public school education standard for all public students in Washington State. In Washington State, you have to have um, studied since time immemorial a Washington State tribal history and sovereignty curriculum. And the state uses traditional stories from coastal culture as the teaching pedagogy for these standards. There's a since time immemorial website that you can go to to check out to see what one part of the country has done that's really cool. And um, I'm going to tell you a story that I learned from that um, effort to bring coastal teaching tools to non coastal teachers. And this story is one of my favorite stories from any tradition. And it's called How Nettle Saved the People. So, a long time ago, on the coast of what's now Washington State, where the Sklalem and Quinault and um, Quileute and Macaw, so many other people who live along the ocean, along the coast, and are fishing people. Long ago, those people lived in fear. All up and down the coast, the Sklalem people were living in fear. They were always looking over their shoulders, always scanning the horizon, always listening for the sounds. What were they listening for? What were they afraid of? They were afraid of the people who came from the north, the Haida. The Haida would come down from what's now called Alaska in their war canoes, and they would come down into the waters off of the coast of the Sklalem and Macaw people, and they would come into those coastal villages and take whatever they wanted, including people for slaves. And so the people lived in fear until one night, a young woman in a village. Now, this young woman in the village, in this particular um, coastal village, she was afraid, or excuse me, she was tired of seeing her people live in fear. She was tired of always living in fear herself. That night, as she went to sleep, she prayed for guidance. She prayed for some kind of solution to this problem of always being afraid. And so that night, she fell asleep. And when she was deep in sleep, she was visited in her dreams by the spirit of the nettle plant. The nettle plant appeared to this young woman and said, go into the woods. Go into the woods and find my plant, the nettle plant. Gather the leaves from my plant and put me in a big basket, a big watertight basket. Fill that basket with leaves and water and then place hot rocks in there to make the water boil. Yes, this was how tea was made. Make that tea from my leaves and when it has cooled and you can drink it, Bring your whole, your whole village around this tea and all drink this tea. And as you drink the tea, as you feel the power of my um, food go into you, say all together in one voice, we will be strong for the ancestors. We will be strong for the people. We will be strong for the ones to come. Well, that young woman woke up from her dream. Ah, oh, what a strange dream that was. 
But because this woman was native, she knew that wisdom and knowledge can come to us in our dreams. And she shared this dream with her fellow villagers and the people knew that she must do this thing. And so the young woman in her village went into the woods and found the nettle plant. And she followed the instructions from the dream. She gathered the leaves, placed them in the watertight basket, filled it with water, put the hot rocks in, boiled the leaves and let it cool. And when it had cooled, the people all together drank that tea. And as they drank it, they said together, as they'd been told to, we will be strong for our ancestors. We will be strong for um, the people. We will be strong for the ones to come. Well, that's what the people did. And as they drank that tea and said these words all in one voice, they could feel the power of the nettle plant entering into their bodies. And they felt stronger. Yes, they felt stronger. No wonder, too, because nettle is filled with nutrients that our body needs to be strong. Well, a few nights later, that young woman dreamed again and was once again visited by the spirit of the nettle plant. Now, this time in her dreams, the nettle spirit said to the young woman, now you must take the bravest among you and go into the woods. Find me again. Find my long stalks covered with stinging leaves. Take those stalks and flog yourselves with them. Whip yourself. Yes. And as you feel the power of the nettle sting enter into your body, say all together in one voice, we will be strong for our ancestors. We will be strong for our people. We will be strong for the ones to come. Well, that young woman woke up from this dream. And when she shared it with the village, there were not quite so many people willing to follow the instructions of the dream. <laughs> but because there were brave people in this village, and not all the people you would expect, they weren't all warrior men. No, there were um, brave people from all ages and genders. And these people followed this young woman into the woods. Actually, the whole village followed her because everyone wanted to watch. And so this young woman walked into the woods with her village and they found a tall nettle covered with stinging leaves and hairs. And the people who had volunteered for this, they stepped forward and they took those nettles in their hands, which stung quite a bit just holding them. And they flogged themselves as they'd been told to. And as they flogged themselves with the nettle and they felt the sting of the nettle enter into their bodies, they said all together in one voice, ouch, we will be strong for the ancestors. Ouch, we will be strong for the people. Ow, we will be strong for the ones to come. And the people who had whipped themselves felt stronger. Their whole bodies were stinging, but they felt completely alive and invigorated. And they also felt quite brave and proud of themselves. And everyone who had watched also felt braver, seeing the courage of their own people. So this was good for the group. Everyone was feeling stronger and healthier. And this was a good thing because just a few days later, word came from the north that ships had been, or excuse me, that the war canoes from the north were coming down the coast, that they were headed towards this village. Now in the past, the people would have gone to their hiding places away from the beach. They would have gone into hiding with all their things. They would have hidden away and waited for the intruders to disappear. But not this time. 
This time was different. This time, the whole village, every one of the people who lived in the village, young and old, male and female, two-spirit, everyone walked down to the beach. And on the beach, the people stood shoulder to shoulder. They stood shoulder to shoulder and looked out towards the horizon where those war canoes were approaching. Now, water uh, carries sound very far. And so, as these people standing shoulder to shoulder raised their voices and all together in one voice, they said, we will be strong for our ancestors. We will be strong for our people. We will be strong for the ones to come. And their voices rolled out over the water as one. And the people in the canoes heard their voices lifted as one. And they saw the people standing shoulder to shoulder. And they could see that something was different. The people in the war canoes could see that these Sklalem people on the shore were not going to let them come into their village and take whatever they wanted. Oh no, they could see that these people were going to put up a fight. And so those Haida war canoes turned around and paddled away and were never seen again in this village. And so this story, how Nettle saved the people, is a story that is still shared on the coast among the people to honor and celebrate the Nettle, a relative with gifts, a kind of scary relative, <laughs> but a relative who just like Dakota people, we relate to it as a food plant, as a medicine plant, and as a utilitarian plan for fiber to make our fishing nets. Now, here in Minnesota, Dakota people have not established and secured our treaty fishing rights. Dakota people who fish um, or use nets in um, Minnesota lakes or streams or rivers without the right licenses and whatnot, risk getting arrested. In Washington state, coastal native people have already established their treaty fishing rights in court based on something called the Bolt decision. This court case in 1971, decided by a Judge Bolt, one of the key pieces of evidence that it hinged on was a 400 year old nettled fishing net that was preserved in the mud off of the coast that showed exactly where coastal people had been fishing. So it helped to establish the traditional fishing um, grounds of coastal people. This is something that Dakota people have yet to secure for ourselves, our fishing rights. But our nets are a traditional um, product that was part of our um, our system of, of um, feeding ourselves from the river. We also had weirs, which are like baskets that are woven that fish kind of get trapped in by swimming into. But nettles are um, kind of considered like a pest plant and they, because they sting, we tend to be shy about them. Now, the story that I just told you references flogging, which is absolutely a traditional healing practice from all over the world, not just by coastal people or Dakota people, but wherever nettles grow in the world, people have discovered that when you flog yourself with nettles, it does create that itchy topical rash that stings. But if you don't touch that rash and don't scratch it, 
the bumps and itch will subside after a good 48 or 24 hours. And it will leave behind a persistent anti-inflammatory effect. So it's really good for aches and pains from things like arthritis, rheumatism, or bursitis. Um, I like to use it on my elbows and um, with time, we tend to become less sensitive to the nettle. So the more we drink it, the more we eat it, the more we handle it, the more we use it as medicine, the less um, likely we are to be stung by the nettle plant. Um, nettles, this is a fresh nettle, which I'm holding by the nettle. And I'm doing that because I'm holding it by the top of the leaves, which have way less of the stinging hairs than the bottom of the leaf. So you can handle this nettle by its leaf. You can also pull some of those leaves off and um, you can roll them in your hands and crush them. You can roll them hair side in and put them in your molars and crush them. Crushing neutralizes the sting. And then you'll have if, you, if you've done that, you'll just end up with like this green goo. And you can take that goo and just rub it on your hands. And it makes a chemical glove that then protects you from the nettle sting. <laughs> so the antidote for the nettle is the nettle. <laughs> um, nettle is um, a plant that... Here in the Midwest, in the fall, when the stalks have grown tall, and, and we don't eat it after it has gone to flower, which is, you know, midsummer, those tall, dry, dead stalks are what are gathered for use in our fishing nets. And um, where I learned to weave um, nettle was in the Northwest where nettle has to be gathered in the early fall while it's still got a lot of sting on it because in the Northwest, it starts to rain in the fall and everything rots, including the nettle. Here, the nettle freeze dries and stays upright and is still standing in the spring. And the elements have done all the work of stripping away all the green material from the stock. So it's perfect at that point for making into fiber. And it's an extremely strong fiber for use as, uh, for fishing nets. Now, Dakota people also, we were weavers and we wove bags, mats, um, various kinds of fittings for inside our lodges, like furniture, like these chair backs that we could lean against. And weaving is not something that people think of when they think of Dakota culture. I, I didn't know that Dakota people were weavers until I was an adult. And of course, it makes complete sense because here in Imnajaska, in St. Paul, this is woodlands. And so woodlands people are often usually basket makers, weavers. So Dakota weaving when Dakota people were exiled from the Twin Cities, we lost access to our weaving traditions, to this river, to our um, long history of being weavers of fishing nets, living on this river, eating fish. So that is something that hasn't happened for a long time here. One of the things that I am really blessed to be doing this year is to be working as one of the Native artists in residence at the Minnesota Historical Society to look at recreating traditional Dakota fishing nets. Now, the really beautiful thing about weaving technologies and stories is that they are evidence of how we are related. So here on this continent, even before invaders came, Dakota people and coastal people from both coasts, from down south, we all traveled around on this continent. 
We shared stories, culture, trade, we intermarried. Our stories and our weaving technologies share that story. The um, technologies and methods of weaving that coastal Northwest people use and Midwestern peoples are the same. So we have um, shared stories and culture and weaving all together. And that's one of the things I love about nettle is that it represents both our history as storytellers, because fishing people are always storytellers, <laughs> and that um, it represents our relationship to our plant relatives, to the nettle, and to fish, to the river, to this river that is our mother here. Um, I think I've already gone over, I'm five minutes over my um, allotted time here. So I'm going to turn you over to our next speaker. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. By the way, I should mention that on May 20th at Fort Snelling, the um, Omnichia event that is happening is where I will be demonstrating um, all about nettles. And if on that day you want to come and have some hands-on experience processing nettles, weaving nettles, tasting nettles, being flogged with a nettle, <laughs> any of the above, please come and join us. Thank you all. Uh -huh. Well, be done, Fern. Um, if I could ask you to take your video off so I could um, hand it off to our, our next presenter will be Jenna. And Jenna is going to talk about all the nutritional and medicinal benefits of nettle. Um, and first, I just wanted to say, Wopira Tanka, thank you so much to um, Wakantipi Awayankapi's Dakota cultural educator, Fern, for sharing those stories with us and the importance of nettle um, in, in our culture. I remember learning one thing a long time ago about, um, I think Fern called it flogging, but like when you get that, um, when you use nettle to on your body to take away that inflammation and how a lot of times it's super painful, right? You get a rash sometimes and all these other things, but it's a, it's a way for us to, that our plans teach us that sometimes you have to go through pain um, before you reach that healing or you have to go through pain in order to heal. And that is one of my, um, my favorite teachings that nettle give, gives us and one of its many gifts. So now I'm really excited to, to hear from Jenna and learn more about the nutritional and medicinal benefits of nettle. I'm gonna hand it off. Thank you, Michelle. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is um, Jenna Graigle and I'm the environmental justice educator and I'm the stewardship coordinator as well here at Wakanti Piawayagapi. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Fern. I, I know we've been nerding out about nettles for since I've known Fern, basically. And I know today she provided us tea and soup, and we've just been having like a really good time getting to know this plant um, more and more, especially for this webinar. And I'm really excited to talk about it because it is such a versatile plant. And I think that you know, it can be used as um, food and medicine and cultural technology, like Fern was talking about, such as like um, rope or crafting and even dye. Um, natural beauty products it can be used for as well, and then um, even garden uses too. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, mainly because there's a lot of information here, so I don't want anybody to miss um, some of this nu nutritional information. So um, just to talk a little bit more too, though, I started getting to know this plant a lot more about four years ago when my partner and I um, started a garden in Red Wing, Minnesota. And the, the nettles there are so numerous and <laughs> so naturally abundant that, you know, when you garden, you kind of naturally get to know what a weed is, you know, quote unquote weed, and are the plants that kind of encroach on your vegetables or whatever you're trying to grow in a space. And so, um, you know, just thinking of weeds as, um, you know, too, too prolific of relatives as opposed to, as opposed to something that is 
unwanted, I think is something that we've tried to do in our garden space. And so um, we started trying to use um, nettles much more and it's become one of our favorite plants, I think in, in my family for sure. Um, but first of all, I wanna talk about all the nutritional benefits because as you can see, um, there are so many vitamins and so many minerals available in just this one plant. Um, and as you can see in this chart, um, this is just based off of one cup of blanched nettles. And you can see that it's very much packed with vitamins and minerals, and it's especially packed with um, vitamin K um, is super high, which is um, something that can be really good for bones and bone tissue. Um, and it's also very high in fiber, manganese and calcium as well. So um, everything else though too, in terms of minerals and vitamins, is just, it's it's um, definitely a superfood, I would call it. Um, and because it is so packed with all these nutrients, I think that um, some of the things that you can look for, um, oh, sorry, if you can go to the next slide, please. So some of the medicinal benefits that you can look for in this is that it, you know, it may lead to reduced inflammation. Um, it may lead to reduced arthritis pain. Um, it can reduce hay fever symptoms, which is something I can personally attest to. I think when allergy season is around, nettle tea is definitely my go-to. Um, it can also aid in blood sugar control. Um, it can... Um, it's said to be able to lower blood sugar. It can also promote hair growth. Um, it can relieve rashes and eczema um, externally, and it's also a natural detox tea as well. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and so, of course, as a preface to all this, um, as with all herbal remedies, it's always okay to be cautious if you've never tried nettle or if you're worried about how it could affect you. Um, you can always get a second opinion from your doctor or medical professional before trying it. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about the uses if you're interested in harvesting it um, or if you're interested in using it. And it's many versatile ways that you can. I think um, my first suggestion though, is that if you are going to eat it, then do not eat it raw. <laughs> because while the sting can be good for you externally, as Fern was saying, I, I can't imagine why eating it um, without taking the sting off would be, um, would be beneficial. I think it would just be a lot of pain for no reason <laughs> because you can, you can actually get rid of the sting. Um, and there are two ways that you can do it. You can either dehydrate it for two weeks, um, or you can also use a dehydrator, um, which could be a really good investment. And then that would um, lower your drying time to 12 to 15 hours. And then you can use that. Um, you can use the, the dry leaves and the stems for tea, or you can combine it with other herbs for tea. Um, but if you're going to use it for something like pesto or soup, then you can also blanch it or saute it in water for a short time, and then then uh, the sting will no longer be there. Um, so, and also, if you do decide to harvest nettles yourself, um, the best protocol, I think, is less than one foot tall. I think that's because that's when the leaves are going to be um, better um, just because they're easier to process as well as they just taste better as well. I think when, when they get too big, they can be take a lot longer to process and they can also just be um, not definitely not as tasty as they would be. Um, and let's see here. So um, in this picture too, these are nettles that um, was just taken. Uh, this picture was just taken last week of the nettles that have already popped up in our garden. So you can also see that they're pretty tall for being for being just um, so short into spring here. So sometimes um, it can be a little difficult to um, catch them in time. But um, another way that we have started using nettles in our garden is that we've been using it for mulch because um, even though uh, or even though um, they're very good for humans and they're also super good for plants too. And so we've been using them as mulch in our garden um, just because the plants like them just as much as we do in terms of health benefits. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I just thought I would share some uh, pesto recipes that we've used in my family. So um, 
or some recipes in general. This one's a pesto recipe. Um, so just like you would use basil and pesto, then you can actually um, just replace the basil with um, with um, uh, raw nettle leaves. And um, so if you take the nettle leaves off and blanch them or saute them for a short time, then you can use the stem and dry that for tea. And then you can use the leaves to, um, to do this um, pesto recipe. And um, what's interesting too, is that you can refrigerate it in a jar for up to three weeks. So you don't have to use it right away. And you can also can and freeze it for up to six months, um, which has been super useful for us. So if you ever go on a huge harvesting day, then it actually is super helpful um, where you don't have to you know, harvest them every week if you want to, you could actually do one big harvest and then save them for, for quite a while. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and this is another favorite in my household. So um, you can actually make a shampoo. So because it is um, because it is such a versatile plant and because it can be so good for um, hair, uh, for hair growth, especially, um, we use a lot of times we more so use the hair rinse recipe. Um, but just a just a warning, though, too, that um, that if you do decide to make your own shampoo or hair rinse, then that actually um, it does have like a short shelf life. So it's not something you can make in bulk. You'd have to use it pretty quickly. Um, and I know for the hair rinse recipe, we've also um, replaced the horsetail with calendula. And that's what's great about making your own stuff is that you can use whatever essential oils or whatever herbs that you really want that you feel like would be um, something that you, you could use, you know, especially if you have easy access to it. Um, and if you could go to the uh, next slide, please. And um, lastly, I just wanted to give a big shout out to these to these native owned businesses um, that have their own nettle products. So there's Lakota Made, um, Tanagida, Towi, and Prairie Willow that all have nettle products. So if you don't have the time or the energy to go and harvest and um, process nettles, then it's totally understandable. But and there's uh, really great businesses, uh, local businesses here actually in Minnesota that you can. Um, support and you can um, support their nettle products that they that they um, process for you and that's great um, yeah and I think that's it for me I'm going to hand it off to Gabby Okay. Uh, oh, thank you so much for, for sharing Jenna I have never used that hair rinse recipe before um, so I'm definitely going to go try that this season. That sounds so lovely. Um, all right. So our next um, uh, presenter is going to be Gabby, who is Wakanti Bialwayankapi's restoration manager. And this evening, Gabby is going to be sharing about the ecological roles and kinship systems of nettles. So Gabby, I'm going to hand it off to you. And I'm so excited to learn from you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Gabby Manuman. Um, I come from the Forest County Potawatomi community up in northern Wisconsin, and I am the environmental restoration manager here at Wakantipia Wayangapi. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, nettles and how they interact with the ecosystem and other um, uh, other beings in the natural world. All right, if you want to go to the next slide. So the Latin name for stinging nettle is Urtica di, uh, dioica. Um, it is part of the nettle family, which is in the uh, Uridaceae family. Um, other relatives of stinging nettle include uh, Canadian wood nettle, uh, dwarf and black fruited clearweed, which are all uh, found here in Minnesota. So nettles are a pretty abundant species. They can be found here in North America, over in Europe, and also in Asia. They're a really, really abundant species. Um, they're very common in a lot of the habitat areas that they grow in. Um, they really enjoy moist sites. Um, they can be found at prairie and woodland edges. 
They really love disturbed sites and they will, uh, they can be found in woodland clearings as well. Um, they really love that nitrogen rich soil and they're, they are an indicator plant for um, high soil fertility as well. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit of the different parts of nettle and how you can uh, identify nettle. So I'll start with the form. So nettles um, grow uh, from a single upright stem. Occasionally they'll branch uh, at the base, but uh, generally they're gonna be a single upright stem. And they like to form these really dense patches. You can see it in that uh, bottom middle picture down there. Um, they really enjoy uh, being with their relatives and they enjoy um, forming these large uh, populations. Um, let's see. And so nettles are considered an aggressive species. Some people even call them invasive. Um, even though they're not invasive, they are from here. They do have those invasive tendencies, uh, such as growing in these really dense patches. They do like to outcompete um, other plants because they do enjoy being in each other's company. Um, nettles also um, have really fibrous and extensive root systems. They um, can reproduce through rhizomes, which are the horizontal um, roots that come off the main root stem. And these rhizomes, as long as there's a small portion of it in the soil, um, these rhizomes can re-sprout uh, new nettles, uh, new nettle plants. Um, so that's where they get these aggressive tendencies from. Um, and Probably what nettles are most famously known for is, are these little hairs found on the stem and um, on the bottom side of the leaves. So these little hairs are called tri trichomes um, and they are really tiny hollow um, hairs found mainly on the stem, uh, on the petioles of the leaf and on the underside of the leaf as well. Um, the, uh, the chemical compounds that are found in these uh, small hairs are the formic acid, um, histamine, and acetylcholine. And um, the histamine is more than likely what is causing people's um, reactions to this plant when they do get stung. Um, so basically how these hairs work, they are a protective system for the plant. Because this plant is so high in nutrients, it's really, really dense in a lot of different nutrients. It has these hairs to protect itself. So the hairs actually have these silica tips which break off and embed themselves into your skin. Um, and those, uh, those histamines, those acetylcholines and the formic acid are what cause that irritating, um, irritating sensation in your skin when you get stung by them. Um, I know firsthand how um, awful the sting can be. I grew up um, next to a creek and my whole life, as I was uh, walking around this creek, every single summer, I would get stung by nettles almost daily. Um, and as a kid, it was very frustrating because um, once I got once you get stung, it's really hard not to touch the area that you got stung. But as I've gotten older, and I also learned from an elder in my community, he had taught um, a small group of us that if you get stung by a nettle, don't touch it for 15 minutes and that sting will subside exponentially. And I've tried it out myself with nettles. I have also tried it out with mosquito bites. I think it's a little bit of a mind game that you have to play with yourself, maybe a little bit of placebo effect, but I mean, for me personally, it does work and um, it helps you build up that tolerance as well. Because once that itching sensation goes away, then you can work on getting those little um, silica hair tips out of your skin. Okay, so the leaves of the nettle. Um, I think the leaves of the nettle are one of the most indicating parts of this plant. Um, so it has really distinct leaves. You can see they're very, um, the, the leaf edges are serrated. They have these really deep prominent veins that you can see. Um, they're this beautiful shade of green that um, not too many plants have this very specific shade of green that I've noticed, um, but the uh, the leaves uh, orientate themselves in, in an opposite pattern. So on one section of the plant, you'll have two leaves that are um, on either end of uh, each other like this. And um, 
they rotate as they go up the stem. So if you're looking from above, you can almost see that um, it's it almost looks like it would be a world pattern, but you had just have two pairs of leaves um, stacked on top of each other going up the stem. Um, so the stalk, that's where most of the hairs are found. Um, so the stalk is also very fibrous. Fern talked about how we how you can use the nettle fibers. Uh, these fibers in the nettle are used as support because they um, this particular species can grow very tall, so it needs a really strong support system. So the um, stems are really fibrous. Um, the flowers are the flowers can range from a pale green to white to even a pinkish tone. Um, they grow in these things called panicles um, at the uh, axle of the leaf, which is where the leaf, um, the, the base of the leaf meets the stem. Uh, the flowers will grow out of the axle and they can appear like these large clumps of flowers and they can also appear, appear as almost a string of flowers as well. Um, and nettles have both male and female flowers. Uh, typically the male and female flowers are found on the same plant. Um, what, I've, what I've typically seen is the female flowers tend to sit at the top of the plant and the male flowers tend to sit at the bottom. And a way to kind of tell the difference between the two uh, types of flowers is the male has this, um, I believe it's called a, stam um, a staminate which um, when you look at the flowers, it just looks like it has an extra little uh, finger coming up um, in the middle of the flower. Um, so after, so I, I believe Fern mentioned that um, the nettle flowers around midsummer. So after it um, has pollinated, it goes to seed. The seeds in the uh, lower right here, um, they are a flat, uh, almost oval-like seed. They're very, very small. And nettle plants are, um, along with being uh, being able to reproduce asexually through the rhizomes, they also produce large amounts of seeds, up to a thousand seeds per plant, uh, which also makes, uh, which is also another characteristic, another aggressive characteristic of this plant. So it is a very pro prolific seeder. And the seeds are very, very tiny, um, uh, almost round uh, brown seeds that you can see in the lower left there. Um, all right, if we could go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinship roles that nettle has with uh, both the environment it lives in and the uh, animals and insects that it also lives with. So nettle are very, very important um, species for a number of different insects. Um, there are over 40 species of insect that almost exclusively rely on nettle in terms of um, either these insects need the nettle for uh, food, for shelter, um, or for a place to lay their eggs and for the larvae to um, hatch. So here in Minnesota, um, the red admiral butterfly and the comma butterfly um, almost exclusively lay their eggs on nettle plants. Um, part of this has to do with the um, the larvae. Once they hatch, they um, they eat the nettle um, because it is so high in nutrients. But the nettle also provides protection for um, insects as well. The there's uh, this little bug called a nettle aphid, um, which um, nettle is the host plant for this nettle aphid um, and uh, both these aphids and caterpillars and other small bugs, they use the nettle for protection because of um, the stinging hairs that it has. Um, and the flowers of the nettle also provide opportunities for pollinators to come by and enjoy the flowers um, because they, they do produce quite a lot of flowers. And when you get these really large, dense patches of them, it's a really great area to have um, for pollinators as well. Um, let's see, small mammals will um, also use the nettle patches for protection as well. Um, small birds and other small um, animals will uh, oftentimes lay their nest within these uh, large dense patches, again, for protection from other wildlife. Um, 
and deer and other small mammals will also browse on nettle as well. Because they are so high in nutrients, it's a great way for these animals to get the um, necessary vitamins and minerals that they need to survive. Um, so other, um, so kinship roles that nettle has with its broader environment. So as I mentioned before, nettle is an indicator of high soil fertility. So they really like these nitrogen rich soils. That's their preferred habitat to grow in. Um, but uh, because, oh, where am I going with this? One second. Okay, so because they like these really nitrogen rich um, areas, they also contain a lot of nitrogen themselves. So when they grow in these dense patches, um, when you have dieback at the end of each year, you're actually, the nettles are actually putting nitrogen back into the soil. So they help um, create this really nitrogen rich topsoil that is really beneficial for the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so, and this, uh, the, the amount of nitrogen that they put back into the soil uh, at the end of each year actually helps with decomposition as well. Nitrogen is a kickstarter for the uh, decomposition process. Um, nettles can also be used in phytoremediation. So they are really tolerant to heavy metals such as um, zinc, lead, and cadmium. Um, they also form this symbiotic relationship with bacteria, which helps with the tolerance to these heavy metals and um, helps them uptake these heavy metals into their system. And they're really good if you are working in a heavily disturbed, um, heavily contaminated soil area because they are so aggressive in their growing. Um, they establish very quickly. They um, generally stick around. Uh, they're hard to get rid of. Um, so when you're looking to uh, help uh, treat the soil by using plants, that is a really good option. Um, because it also grows very fast also. So if you need something, uh, so it can be used as a cover crop for these highly contaminated soil areas. Um, so these really aggressive characteristics that nettle um, is said to have uh, come in handy when um, you're dealing with uh, areas that um, need a little more love and care and um, tending to. Um, and a little bit on harvesting. So I want to touch a little bit on sustainable harvesting for nettle. So generally the rule of thumb that I used for myself is I do not take more than a quarter of um, the population that you are working with, that you are uh, taking from, sorry. Um, but nettles, um, because they are, because they do have those ag aggressive growing uh, tendencies, um, they, they bounce back very quickly if you harvest them, as long as those, like I said before, as long as those rhizomes are still in the soil, they'll sprout um, new plants um, by the next year. So um, that's one thing to consider with uh, nettle harvesting as well. And I think that's all I had for right now. Okay. Oh my gosh. Uh to thank Gabby for sharing um all of that knowledge. I always learn so much. I I love gifts of the plant nation program because every every season we get to highlight a new plant relative and learn everything from cultural stories and sharing to medicinal benefits to their role in our ecosystems. And I just think it's so amazing. Um we now we're in our Q&A section and we do have a, an immediate question that probably is geared more towards Gabby about um, harvesting metals that might be in heavy metal areas. And I'm, you know, I think that is a question that's going to, you know, come up for a lot of our plants that are phytoremediators, um, knowing that they take up those heavy metals. Is it still safe to harvest them if you know that they might be in disturbed and contaminated soils? Um, I would generally say no, if you know what the soil conditions are like, if you know that they, uh, the area is, um, has a lot of heavy metals in it, just because, uh, the nettle does uptake it in itself, it holds those heavy metals within themselves. So if you were to ingest, uh, that nettle, you are uptaking a certain degree of those heavy metals as well. Um, 
that's just the general rule of thumb I have for myself. If you know the site is not um, healthy, I generally don't recommend you harvest from it anyways, but yep, that's my recommendation. Uh, thank you so much. We have another one that says, um, I think maybe from Facebook Live that says, thank you so much for sharing. What should we watch for to know when to stop harvesting nettles for food and tea? Fern mentioned midsummer in Minnesota, but is there a botanical stage to watch for, such as the first flowers? What would be your recommendations? That could be for Jenna or Gabby or Fern. Um, I can hop in and answer that. Um, I believe Fern had said that you uh, stop harvesting um, just before it flowers. Um, it's really important when uh, plants start flowering that you give them um, the ability to produce those flowers. It requires a lot of energy to produce flowers, so um, you don't generally want to harvest uh, harvest them when they're in that stage. Yeah, and I know Jenna had a recommendation, I think, too, about maybe stopping when they're about one foot high um, uh, for tea and for food. We have a question um, that uh, is geared towards Jenna. How many minutes um, should you blanch the leaves so when you're trying to get the sting out of there? Right. I think um, for us, we usually do just a few minutes. Honestly, I think any sort of hot water would um, would neutralize the sting. Usually, I think um, some people, some people I know, saute it as opposed to blanching it. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it, it's no time at all. Honestly, it's not anything where you need to do it for days on end or anything. It's just uh, a few minutes usually. Awesome. And uh, this question I think can be for all of our panelists. Have you also heard that older nettle leaves can cause some issues with bladder stones or gallstones or due to one of its minerals? Do we know anything about that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I was taught that one of the reasons we don't eat the plant after it has grown. And when you say that if once it's grown over a foot tall, you're also talking about a plant that's blooming. So, um, but the blooming stage is when we want to stop eating the plant because at that point it has a mineral content that can be burdensome to kidneys and um, gallbladder. Um, and it also has gotten tough and stringy as well. <laughs> While I have you, Fern, could you um, announce again when the demonstration is that you're going to have on how to make the nettle netting? Yes, that will be on May 20th at Fort Snelling for the Omnichie Festival. And um, I don't know offhand what time exactly, but you'll be able to find me and I'm sure I'll be doing demonstrations throughout the day. Um, I just happen to have a a pile of nettle fiber oh here. It looks gosh. like wool almost. It does. It's so beautiful. People are always amazed at how incredibly fine the hairs are. And and how you can weave with nettle a lot. It reminds me, it's a lot like wool in some respects. Uh, but Fern, um, do you know if that uh, the nettle cordage used for all of the woven items that you mentioned before, such as the bags and mats, yes. um, was it just nettle or were other plants used as well? Basswood was also a popular fiber um, uh, plant. I would say that basswood and nettle were the two most popular. And for fishing nets, they were both used. The nettle was to make the body of the net and the basswood was for trimming it and tying on the weights and floats. Um, I, I have the feeling that nettle is the stronger of the two fibers, but basswood is silkier and lighter and therefore was probably more popular um, that would go into anything that would be next to your skin. Awesome. Thank you so much. You, you, you want to know something else I've noticed is that by examining the collections of Dakota material objects at the Minnesota History Center, 
I see non-commercial plant fiber in a lot of Dakota made objects, you know, from the last century that um, everything I had known was that Dakota people only, only used plant sinew, but that's obviously not the case. And so I suspect that nettle was uh, more of an everyday sewing fiber than we know, than we knew. You know, we we also have one other question that I um, that is in the chat here, and someone is asking, do nettle leaves have a scent? I think they have their own scent, but it's not a strong scent. But it has an earthy, sort of musky smell to it. And when I taste nettle super tea, it's the same. That same flavor note is in the taste. So I do think it has a light distinctive scent, but it's not a stinky plant by any stretch. Um, also, Fern, I just had your amazing nettle soup. And oh, good. <laughs> I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that process. How did you make it? Absolutely. So I gathered fresh nettles. And so um, you saw the picture that Jenna showed you of the nettle shoots from her garden. And that's literally where I got the, um, I gathered from Jenna's garden spot. <laughs> There's so many nettles there. But what I was also taught to um, make sure that the plant has four true leaves so that your um not squashing the energy of this emerging plant too much. But I will say that nettle is one of those plants that after it's six inches tall and it has four true leaves, if you trim it, if you gather those tops for soup, the plant then doubles and sends up two shoots and it will produce twice as many leaves. So nettles are one of those plants that respond to humid attention by growing more. <laughs> and um, so you can sort of um, tend and, and trim your nettle patch to make it more productive without hurting it. And, and like Gabby said, you really want to make sure not to over harvest from any one spot. I always try to find some place that everyone hasn't been picking in. You're lucky if you've got a private landowner friend who will let you pick nettles. But um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there. Oh, oh yes. There we go. There's the link to the Fort Snelling event there in in one of the in the chat too. By the way, did I answer your question? <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you about the soup. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So, like Jenna said, you really only have to pour boiling water over the leaves and they instantly are neutralized. So you really don't have to worry too much about the sting. And just like, say, spinach, you're going to gather a lot of leaves and once they are blanched, they compress just like spinach. You might gather four cups of leaves that end up in one cup of um, cooked leaves then. But it also is a very rich, dense food. And four cups of leaves is great for a pot of soup that feeds 10 people. And I like to put in an onion and garlic. Uh, I saute onion and garlic. I put ginger in this particular one. I add my chicken stock, or you could use vegetable stock if you wanted to make it vegan or vegetarian. And then I add potato for thickening. And when the potato's soft, then I toss in my nettle. And I like to cut the nettle up just because after the greens are cooked, which is just 10 minutes tops, lightly stewing, you don't want to boil them also. You pour it in a blender and blend it or use a submersible blender. And if you have long pieces of nettle in your soup, they can actually tangle up your blender. <laughs> so you want to cut them up into short pieces. Um, and then just, and then you're ready to eat it. Um, oh, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. 
coconut milk and green curry. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of a, um, it's like an Asian fusion themed nettle soup. You can also make it more like a traditional, like cream of spinach soup where you're say sauteing some onions and garlic, put in your stock, add your nettles. As soon as it's cooked, you just blend it and it's a cream soup. You could add dairy at that point, including cream or sour cream. But these days I'm enjoying more of a non-dairy version. And it's such a, um, it's got such a uh, mild flavor, but also this rich earthy flavor that's very satisfying. And it's also uh, a flavor base that um, is a good canvas for other flavors, like for instance, the onion, ginger, garlic, curry, or lemon and onion and garlic. So it's a nice um, canvas <laughs> for adding flavors to. Yes, it's, um, I wish everybody on Zoom and Facebook Live could taste how amazing this soup is. It, um, it is so delicious. But I think that wraps up our Q&A session. We did have one more question here asking um, if there will be copies of receipts available and, or recipes, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> long end of the day. Um, copies of recipes available, at which point um, I think we can all just direct folks and let everyone know that this will be recorded um, and put on Wakan TV, a Y on Copies YouTube, as well as Facebook and probably newsletter um, and things like that, that you can come back to and refer for those recipes. Um, and I just want to say Wobita Tonka again to Fern, Jenna, and Gabby um, for such a lovely evening. I feel like I learned so much. And um, this is Plant Nation number three of Gifts of the Plant Nation. So this summer, I think Wakanti Bia Wayankapi will be doing the fourth session on uh, or bee balm, AKA wild Monarda. I have to remember all of um, their names. Um, but anyways, I think um, this concludes our evening of lovely learning and presenting um, from Wakanti Bia Wayankapi. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, this will be recorded and available to come back to, and we hope to see you at the next one.